the German front line in Normandy. The one thing that Hitler had said could never happen, a successful Allied invasion, had occurred. For Rommel, defeat now seemed inevitable. Thirteenth of June, 1944. Dearest Lutzi, the battle is not going well for us, mainly because of the enemy's air superiority and heavy naval guns. It's time for politics to come into play. Rommel wanted to sue for peace with the British and the Americans. Trading on his personal bond with Hitler, he set out to persuade the Führer. I think it was on the 17th of June that he went to see Hitler. He said, I'm going there to give him a piece of my mind. I'll tell him that we have to end all this. Rommel still believed that reasonable men could lead Hitler in the right direction. People like Rommel himself, who had so often demonstrated to Hitler that he was on his side and wanted to help him. After the field marshal came back, he said very openly in front of six or seven of us that he thought that the Führer's headquarters probably did have a better overview. But the next day, after sleeping on it, he changed his mind. Hitler's fooled me again, he said. It makes me puke that it's happened again. Rommel's despair infected the mood inside his own headquarters. We acquired a reputation for defeatism. Honestly, the operations officer would begin the day by slagging off Hitler. Officers used to go round openly saying how things were going to end badly. I experienced this atmosphere of defeatism every day. By July 1944, with the situation in Normandy deteriorating by the day, talk of getting rid of Hitler was commonplace. Rommel would have none of it. He confined his protest over Hitler's strategy to writing a memorandum. Five days later, on July the 20th, 1944, a group of army officers took a different course. A bomb went off in the Führer's headquarters. Hitler escaped with only minor injuries. I believe that for Rommel, I believe that the idea of murdering the Supreme Commander was simply not acceptable to Rommel. He did not have the qualities possessed by those members of the resistance who were prepared to kill the tyrant. In Berlin, the Nazis staged a show trial for leading members of the anti-Hitler conspiracy. Behind the scenes, Gestapo interrogators heard the name Rommel from the lips of several plotters. Any consideration of Rommel's loyalty was swept away by Hitler's paranoia. By now, Rommel was back in Germany convalescing. He had been severely injured in an RAF attack on his staff car. With no inkling of the suspicions lurking in Hitler's mind, Rommel reflected to his son on a military career that had ended in disaster. My father talked about his life as being a total failure. Looking back, he said that he should have been a shepherd in the Swabian Alps rather than a field marshal. The Gestapo had the Rommel home under constant watch. Hitler had already decided his fate. But he could not afford to treat the Desert Fox, the hero he had created, like a common criminal. Rommel was informed that two generals from Berlin would see him on the 14th of October, 1944. He thought they were coming to grill him about the defeat in Normandy. 
When these generals came, they asked to speak to my father alone. Then one of the generals, General Meissel, went outside. The other, General Burgdorf, stayed inside. My father came out with Burgdorf and went up to my mother and told her, I have been accused of being part of the conspiracy against Hitler. Hitler has given me the opportunity of taking poison, and if I do this, they would not take the usual measures against the family. At that time, that meant being put into a concentration camp. If you tell anyone about this, you'll be in danger of being picked up the next day and you'll disappear. The two generals accompanied Rommel on a short car journey out of Herlingen. Once the car stopped, he took a poison capsule, doing the Führer's bidding one last time. The German public was told Field Marshal Rommel had succumbed to the injuries he received in Normandy. The charade of a state funeral was then played out, but Hitler refused to attend. The rumour spread that Rommel's death had been no accident. I went to see my chief of staff, General Krebs, and reported to him. And when I told him that Rommel had been murdered, he said to me, Listen, my dear Bear, if you are under the illusion that you will get a state funeral, then I have to tell you, you are wrong. That was his way of telling me not to talk about it anymore. Within months, Hitler was also dead. Shortly afterwards, the true story of Rommel's suicide emerged, and a new Rommel legend was born. Rommel the anti-Nazi, a legend that would be used in a new propaganda war, the Cold War against the Soviet Union. He came to hate Hitler and all his works and took part in the conspiracy to rescue Germany by displacing the maniac and tyrant. For this, he paid the forfeit of his life. In the somber wars of modern democracy, there is little place for chivalry. The Americans, the British and the French, who had wanted to eliminate forever the dreaded German army, now needed to revive it as a counterweight to the Russians. Rommel died believing he had failed his country. He could never have expected to be the symbol of its rebirth. <laughs>